welcome to Land of a Thousand Pagodas, the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Bagan, Myanmar. Thank you all for joining us for what promises to be a fascinating evening. My name is Natalie Pearson and I work at the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre here at the University of Sydney. And I'd like to begin tonight by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and to pay my, res my respects to their elders past, present and future. So tonight's event is hosted by the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre, which is one of the multidisciplinary initiatives here at the University of Sydney. And what this means is that we work across faculties. We're not affiliated with any particular faculty. Um, so we have uh, over 500 academic members and about 200 postgraduate members working across disciplines uh, and across Southeast Asia. We like to think of it in terms of different research clusters. And in fact, I'm really pleased that tonight's event is going to feature speakers engaging with each of those five research clusters. We obviously have heritage and the arts, but we also have economic and social development, environment and resources, health, and state and society. So I'm thrilled that they're all going to be represented here tonight. The impetus for this event came about because Bagan was listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in June of this year, some 24 years after it was first nominated. And we wanted to hold an event that acknowledged the significant occasion and also gave us the opportunity to showcase the research and engagement that is taking place at this university and beyond in Myanmar. The planning and the execution of this event has been largely undertaken by students enrolled in the Project Management Master's Capstone Program. It's not often that we let students run an event for us here at the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre. But these students are interested in real-world experiential learning for project students. And they have really done a terrific job in pulling together tonight's events. So I would like to acknowledge their hard work. We've had two groups of five working across semesters. In semester one, we had Anu Palmer, Vanya, Yosua, Zen and Zihan. And in semester two, we have Yupen, Zi, Hulun, Xi King and Mali. Tonight, we have a very diverse range of speakers and activities. We're going to start with our keynote speaker, Professor Richard Mackay, AM, who will speak about his experiences in Bagan as a World Heritage Advisor for the International Council on Monuments and Sites, or ICOMOS. And Richard undertook the technical in-country assessment of the nomination for Bagan as part of the World Heritage Committee's listing process. Richard's talk will be followed by a Q&A from the <coughs> audience. And after that, we'll have our lightning talks. So these lightning talks are going to be featuring researchers from the Sydney Southeast Asia Centre working across all of the research clusters. We're going to be hearing about pesticides and agriculture. We're going to be hearing about pregnancy and health. We're going to be hearing about private sector development and new technologies. And we're going to be hearing about human rights and all in the context of Myanmar. And tonight's event will conclude with a dance by the Myanmar Cultural Society. After which I invite you to join us all for re refreshments and conversation just through here. First though, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Lewis de Borda uh, to uh, tell you a little bit more about the Capstone Project. And Lewis uh, leads the Capstone Project for the master's students, but he's also the country coordinator for Myanmar. So Lewis, if you'd like to come up and let us know a little bit more about the work that your students have been doing, that would be wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. Um, as you just heard, I am the country co coordinator for Myanmar um, and also coordinator for the master's uh, program in project management. So I thought this would be an opportunity to blend the two things. Uh, I, I have a great interest in Myanmar. I have some probably DNA in there somewhere. I uh, was born in the country. But uh, my, my greater interest, I guess, was uh, sparked quite later in life when I actually did visit the garden. So I can attest that it's uh, an amazing uh, jaw-dropping site and quite interesting. And I'm sure we'll hear more about it and hopefully pique your interest as well. But I'm going to take a few minutes to talk more about how this event came together and the project management side of the, uh, the creation of this event. As Natalie said, we are um, 
you know, a group of project management uh, professionals. Uh, we deliver a course out of uh, the Sydney University. We're in the Faculty of Engineering. But what we aim to do is really try and make it as real as possible. And while an event management kind of aspect is only a taste tester for what a project might be, it's a great experience, I hope, uh, for the students to actually uh, you know, feel the soft skills that are needed in getting something like this together. So we treated this event as a project, and uh, the capstone itself is uh, the, the kind of the polish, polishing last project that the students do before they graduate with their, their masters. So we didn't have just one team, as Natalie said, we had two teams to do this. The first team's job was uh, Team Alpha. Coincidentally, both teams are Team A's, as we call it. So they, they, you've got the A team here, uh, twice. Uh, so this was the first team who last semester had to convince Natalie and Siak that this was a doable thing, that this was something they wanted to do, and uh, engender trust, I guess, to, to make this event happen. And this is the team that did it. Uh, handing off to the team Avengers, again, another A, as you can see. And this is the team you will hear more from tonight, who took the baton over and essentially completed this to allow you to come here tonight. And I hope you have a, a good experience in that. Um, I guess there's a, a question that in many people's minds, some of you might have seen this ad from uh, Toyota uh, that uses the, the line that what is a project manager and the fact that most people don't know what they do. Uh, so I thought I'd just quickly address this. Uh, this if you haven't seen the ad, this father is uh, at a parent kind of uh, uh, event explaining what it is a project manager does and the funny part is everybody you know, knows what a fireman does, what a police officer does, teacher does, but nobody knows what this gentleman does and it, to the embarrassment of his uh, young daughter. So I hope to, to kind of take my time to maybe just answer that little question for you given we graduate a lot of project managers here. So project management has a lot of, if you want to call it theory, and it's, it's such a practical subject that I, I, I'm loath to call it theory, but you know, there's a frameworks about how you manage projects, etc. Uh, and, and essentially we ask our students to show that they've applied those things. So the teams have actually gone through forth to run this event. They had to look at who the stakeholders were, how to convince SEAC that this was a, as I said, a, a good value proposition to run this event and let it be run by students. Uh, you can see that the, the delivery was, you know, involved the proposal, the logistics of getting the event advertised, marketed, arranging the speakers, of which there are quite a number. So it's actually uh, quite a, a, a small but significant challenge, especially as it's all done in a 13-week semester. So, you know, the teams, uh, two 30-week semesters is what got us here. So I wanted to leave you with the answer to what project management is about. And that is that it basically makes things happen or gets things done. And it's not trivial to, to pull together an event like this. You don't necessarily have to use project management, but I can tell you project management makes it better and you can you can tell me at the end of this event if that's true. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us and Thanks so much, Lewis. Great overview, and um, we're very grateful for the students' enthusiasm and professionalism in putting the event together. Okay, so it's now my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Richard Mackay. And Richard is the Director of Possibilities at Mackay Strategic. He's also a founding partner of GML Heritage, an adjunct professor at the Trobe University, and a member of the New South Wales Independent Planning Commission. So he's very busy and we are very lucky to have him. He's just got off the plane from Marrakesh where he's busy planning the next ECOMOS meeting which will be held in Sydney in October next year, the next ECOMOS General Assembly. Um, so he has been an ECOMOS cultural advisor at recent sessions of the UNESCO World Heritage Committee. And he's a member of the National Executive Committee of Australia ECOMOS. And as I said, he's convening the General Assembly in October 2020 in Sydney. 
He's a past chair of the Australian World Heritage Advisory Committee and he wrote the heritage theme of both the 2011 and the 2016 Commonwealth State of the Environment reports. In 2003, he was made a member of the, in the General Division of the Order of Australia for services to archaeology and cultural heritage. In 2018, Richard undertook the technical advisory mission to Bagan as part of the ECOMOS evaluation of the World Heritage nomination, which is what he's going to be speaking to us about tonight. So Richard will speak to us for about 30 minutes and we'll have about 15 minutes for questions at the end. There will be roving mics for those of you who want to ask questions. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Richard up to the stage. Thank you. Well, thank you, Natalie, and uh, thank you, Lewis, and uh, friends and colleagues. The title of um, this evening's session is A Land of a Thousand Pagodas, and I, I will come back to that um, during the course of uh, my presentation because um, a thousand is unfortunately something of an understatement. But before I commence, I'd like to also like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation as the, and uh, the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting. Extend my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend those respects also to Indigenous people who are in attendance here today. It was actually the 6th of July uh, that Bagan came onto the floor of the World Heritage Committee, 21 member states, um, meeting in Baku in Azerbaijan to consider the inscription of Bagan on the um, World Heritage Committee list established uh, by the uh, 1972 Convention Concerning the World's Cultural Heritage Properties. And when the gavel of the chair came down, um, it is fair to say that the room erupted, um, hence the rather grainy, shaky um, photograph. Uh, the Myanmar flag went up, people burst into tears, there were parasols and there were um, the, 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 the delegation was mobbed. And it was indeed um, the culmination of a process that had taken two and a half decades in fits and starts um, with a lot of political machinations, a lot of research and a lot of work by passionate people behind the scenes. Um, no one more passionate than this um, employee of the Department of Archaeology and Monuments who for some years has had the World Heritage logo uh, tattooed <laughs> on, his, on his neck. And you can hardly get more enthusiastic um, than that. Uh, so for those who are interested in that sort of background process, there was a nomination of a, a smaller area, uh, particularly focused on archaeology and monuments that had been submitted in 1995. And at its 21st session in 1996, the World Heritage Committee had referred that back to the State Party. Um, when the World Heritage Committee refers something back, it's actually saying, look, we're not prepared to inscribe this property as nominated in its current form, you need to go away and do a bit of a, a rethink. And there were a lot of issues. There were issues to do with um, the research, the extent of the included area, intrusions, unsatisfactory arrangements for management. Um, the other things that the committee can do, it can decide not to inscribe. Um, when not to inscribe is recommended, what normally happens is the country withdraws the nomination. Uh, or it can inscribe, which is what happened uh, in July this year, or it can do what's called a deferral, where it, it says, look, take it away, um, we're, we're broadly happy, but you need to do some work to tidy up the nomination before we'll do the inscription. So this was referred, it needed more work, and of course, um, in the period since, Burma, Myanmar has gone through an absolute um, transformation, socially, politically, economically, and the whole question of um, the nomination, the arrangements for management, the place of this site in the pantheon of world heritage places um, underwent a sea change. And so the time was right uh, for a renomination which took place in 2017 uh, with an evaluation through 2018 and an, ins and an inscription uh, in July this year. So what was inscribed was the sacred landscape. Uh, it's no longer monuments and an archaeological site, it's actually the entirety of the landscape, including 
uh, the topography, the vegetation, the built forms, but also the intangible. What happens in this landscape, the people who are there, what they do, what they think, what they believe. So there, there are a whole lot of attributes that go into making up the totality of the Bagan World Heritage property. Um, there is, of course, the internationally renowned uh, Buddhist architecture from the 11th to the 13th century, um, but strongly associated with that architecture is the whole uh, concept of merit making, the Theravada Buddhist tradition of building temples and making offerings as part of your ritual system of beliefs. So the reason there are so many pagodas in this landscape is that this is what you aspire to do if you were a Buddhist living in this part of the world in the 11th to 13th century. You would work hard, you would assemble resources for the purpose of erecting a pagoda as a merit-making, self-improvement um, kind of exercise. Uh, what else is there apart from the, the built form? Well, there, there is a truly rich archaeological resource because there is all the remains not only of long gone buildings like this former royal palace, but also all of the residential communities that have lived in this landscape for a millennium. So that's all there sitting under um, existing um, rural um, agricultural lands and that, that sort of scenic landscape that I showed a couple of images ago. Um, there is the continuing Buddhist tradition that people have been making offerings and praying at these temples to these images for uh, the best part of a thousand years. And they're still doing it today. And one of the important things about this landscape and one of the issues that arises in terms of its role now in, in global tourism is that this activity, which is an activity of local people, needs to be able to be facilitated and continued. It's been a real issue, for example, at Angkor Wat, where the growth of mass tourism has actually displaced monks from um, the temples that are important to them. Um, there is, of course, majestic art, and the art appears in many forms, in um, painted murals or in car carvings that are part of the, um, the pagoda masonry, and, of course, um, literally tens of thousands of exquisite Buddha images, the best of which have been removed from the site and are now in museums in Bagan and in Yangon, um, not to mention in New York and Los Angeles and uh, London. But there's also uh, a very strong tradition of traditional culture. And I think, again, one of, the, one of the, the issues that this community now faces with the World Heritage Inscription is do you continue to support this kind of bucolic agrarian rural lifestyle, or do these communities also aspire to internet access and air travel and um, iPhones? Are they entitled to the sort of same benefits of evolved civilization and technology as we are, or is this an important thing that needs to constrain the way their social development uh, takes place? And it's, it's, a, it's a serious um, consideration. So coming to the inscription itself, um, what's on the screen, because this is um, all I have access to in high resolution, is actually the nominated property rather than the inscribed property. Uh, we're talking around 120 um, square kilometres in total, and you can see up in the top uh, right-hand corner there, um, located in the sort of southwest of um, Myanmar, uh, inland, um, bounded, or, or sorry, uh, transected by the Irrawaddy uh, River, and the orange elements are the components of the inscribed site. And there, there are some small amendments that took place in this area here to connect this component with the one to the south, so it's slightly bigger here. And then the yellow area, um, so orange, orange is the inscribed site, which now has seven components, not eight. And the yellow area is the, the buffer zone, the protection zone, the area around that site, which is its visual and physical setting, which is also controlled in terms of allowable activities and restrictions on um, local people and what can and cannot happen. And again, there were some changes through the process to the buffer zone down here and a little small change, like change over here. Um, and just to put that in context, um, we talk, I mentioned briefly that the um, thousand pagodas was something of an understatement. Um, just jumping back one slide, 
Uh, what I'm showing you here is component one, which is the big orange block. So we're talking something of the order of 30 to 40 square kilometres. And in that 30 to 40 square kilometres, now on the screen in front of you, um, the blue dots, of which there are hundreds, are uh, uh, water features, reservoirs, hydrology and the like, and the red features, of which there are also hundreds, uh, indeed thousands, are the pagodas. The pagoda count is actually 3,595. Um, that's the number. I haven't visited all of them, um, <laughs> but I have, I have actually run my eye across the database that has all of them because they're extremely well documented by um, researchers um, over something like half a century. And some of them are absolutely magnificent. And by far my favourite are the four boundary stupas, which are not quite located at the north, south, east and west extremities, but at four extremities of the site. Um, very majestic uh, structures from the 11th century, um, clad in gilt, believed by some to each contain um, two teeth of the, of the Buddha, so one tooth in each of the stupas, and very prominent um, iconic landmarks within the Bagan cultural landscape. So coming to the inscription itself, um, Bagan has been inscribed under, ten, uh, under three of the ten World Heritage criteria. And the first criterion it was um, decided as meeting is criterion three, which is that Bagan is an exceptional and continuing testimony to the Buddhist cultural tradition of merit making and to the peak of Bagan civilization in the 11th to 13th centuries when it was the capital of a regional empire. So this, is, this criterion is contextualising Bagan um, in, in, in Myanmar and regional history, and it's particularly emphasising this notion of um, merit-making and the, the peak of the, of the civilization. And it's manifest right through to today in terms of continuing aspects of ceremony or offerings and Buddhist practice. So this, this is an evolved cultural landscape that is still sacred, that is still lived in, that is still a focus for worship. And this means it looks a bit too enthusiastic. This is a, this is a really um, interesting thing in terms of what's happened in world heritage and our understanding of what constitutes outstanding universal value for humanity. Um, it reflects a shift in East-West philosophy and paradigms. So when, when the World Heritage Convention was first um, introduced in 1972, and Australia was one of the first uh, signatories, there was a huge focus on Western constructs and Western constructions. If you look at the World Heritage List even today, there is a preponderance of European cathedrals and English palaces and castles and built forms. And so the, the early years of the convention, right into the 90s, saw all these edifices. Um, Stonehenge, I guess, being one of the iconic ones. But this is the Taj Mahals and all of those kind of um, cathedral-like places. But what has happened in the last 20 years, especially following the inscription of Angkor Cambodia on the, the World Heritage List in the early 1990s, is an understanding that universal values can also vest in intangible attri attributes in what people do and what they believe. So you see this shift in paradigm from a Western set of attributes and values related to bricks, mortar, stones and place to something that is also embracing the notion of use, association, function, belief and meaning, which is the kind of values that you see in the right of the image. Or if I could again use an Angkor example, um, at Angkor, um, one of the historic and continuing tradition is the Apsara Dancer, the celestial body represented by the dancer on Earth. In the 1980s and 1990s, the Apsara on the left had world heritage values, but the Apsara on the right did not. And for those of you who are interested in this piece, if you compare the inscription um, citations and criteria for Angkor and Bagan, it is very interesting because the Angkor one is very focused on the physical, whereas the Bagan one is justifiably and reasonably recognising the physical but celebrating the intangible. Which brings me to Criterion 2. And this is the one about the, um, the architecture and the, 
the physical presence. That Bagan contains an extraordinary ensemble of Buddhist monumental architecture, reflecting the strength of religious devotion of an early major Buddhist empire. Within the context of the rich expressions and traditions of Buddhist architecture and art found throughout Asia, Bagan is distinctive and outstanding. And it absolutely is, because of those 3,595 pagodas, about 1,000 are monumental. They are enormous structures, um, and they are exquisite in their level of detail and craftsmanship. Uh, and, and some of them are, are simply beyond kind of human experience unless you've been there. This is a Nanda, which is one of the, 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 the really uh, you know, large buildings that would be monumental and globally significant of itself, and yet it's one of a set of hundreds of analogous structures. And the third criterion is criterion six, that it's an exceptional example of the living Buddhist beliefs and traditions of merit making expressed through the remarkable number of surviving stupas, temples and monasteries supported by con continuing, continuing religious traditions and activities. And here we are really getting into the notion of the associative landscape with its continuing cultural traditions and values. And it's manifesting things like contemporary mon monasteries. So this monastery is not from the 11th or the 13th century, but it is nevertheless contributory to those um, values for which the site is inscribed. As is the practices, or as are the practices that happen inside these monasteries, such as um, teaching, study, and worship. Not to mention, um, Crafts, where again, unlike a, a, the, the, the sort of more westernised world, there, there is there is a whole socio-economic context and background, whether it's agriculture or whether it's the um, the lacquer making that we see here on the screen. All these activities are part of that use and association that contribute to the significance of the site. Not to mention um, some of its associated. Memories. Uh, the gun contains um, not one, not two, but three of the artefacts that contribute to the UNESCO Register of the Memory of the World. So these are things like the Rosetta Stone that are documents that are fundamental to our understanding and our memory of world history. And there's a bell and there's a stele and there's another uh, stone tablet at the gun, all of which are already inscribed on the UNESCO um, Memory of the World Register. Well, I talked about the criteria, um, and I particularly talked about the notion of the landscape, the associative values, and the, the monumental architecture, as well as the art. And that is important. This, this property would not have been inscribed on the World Heritage List without meeting those criteria. But the criteria are only one of three tests that are necessary for a place to have outstanding universal value and become a World Heritage property. The other two tests, the, the pillars shown on the left of the screen, are that the place needs to meet the condition of integrity and authenticity, and that it needs to have satisfactory protection and management. And this is really different from how we list things in Australia. So our state heritage registers and our national heritage list list places because they are important, if you like, because they meet the criteria. But internationally, with the World Heritage List, that's not good enough. You also have to retain integrity of the place. It has to be authentic, and it has to have adequate protection and management. And when you think about it, that makes sense, because what UNESCO says to the world is, if you want to put your places up and say they are of value to all humanity, they are actually only valuable to all humanity if they are still authentic, not phony or colonial, reconstructed Disneyland, and if you're going to look after them. Because if you're not going to do that, don't put them up to be on the World Heritage List. So a lot of my work in Bagan in 2018 was not so much focused on those three criteria because there's a global network of experts about which I'll tell you in a minute. My work was particularly focused on have we got an authentic site? Does this site retain its integrity? Has it got adequate protection and management? Um, now there won't be questions, well you can ask them if you like, there won't be questions of you later to memorise this process, but just to put things in context. Um, these are the steps through which a nomination dossier goes between being submitted down the bottom here and being um, a report to the World Heritage Committee at the top. And I just highlight that there is, in the orange boxes, um, quite a lot of 
interchange with the state party, the country who nominates. Um, there is our interaction between the World Heritage Centre and UNESCO and the advisory bodies, in this case ICOMOS, the International Council on Monuments and Sites. And the bit that I do, which is up over here, the on-site mission expert, is just one input into a multinational, multidisciplinary stream of assessment that leads ultimately to a report and a recommendation. But the good news for me is that I'm the person that the people see in country. So if the site gets inscribed, I get all the glory. Um, of course, if the site doesn't get inscribed, I get all the blame. So, what does an evaluation look like? Well, the evaluation starts with the nomination dossier. There is then the technical mission. It's big and bold there because it's important. There's a lot of research um, in addition to what the nominating country uh, puts forward. And there is expert evaluation um, by academics in the related dis discipline, by international scientific committees, by specialist organisations. Uh, then information goes back to the country and, and questions are asked. The country gets to submit supplementary information and then there is consultation with the National Committee of the International Council on Monuments and Sites. So it's a thorough and interactive process with a lot of opportunities to respond to issues and submit more information where something might be deficient. And let me tell you, with this site, all of the steps in that previous um, slide happen big time. And just in terms of when I, when I talk about experts, all of this feeds into an internationally drawn panel. Um, so the recommendation and the evaluation, while it's informed by the kind of work I do, is not my opinion, it's the opinion of the panel. And the composition of the panel is shown on that screen. I'm the yellow dot down over there in Australia. But you can see it's kind of, it's, it's, it is globally drawn and it is also um, multidisciplinary. And it's a 16-month process. Uh, again, you're not meant to read all the, the detail on the screen, but the nomination is received by ECOMOS uh, usually a couple of months after it's been submitted because it's checked for completeness. <coughs> and then there is this whole process of peer review, evaluation of documents, asking of questions, mission in country, uh, response to the questions, panel meetings, more questions, another panel meeting, all before it goes to the committee, by which time down here, the cycle has started again with the next round. Um, the desktop review is incredibly important, and the desktop review for Begun um, is kind of shown indicatively on the screen in front of you. We are talking um, tens of thousands of pages of documents. And now I didn't read every one, but I read an awful lot of them. And when these reviews are done, they give rise to questions, and the questions then get submitted and, and answered. The, the actual dossier, for those who are interested, is this pile of documents on the right. So it's about, um, uh, I don't know, about 10 kilos worth of documents to add into one's luggage. My luggage incidentally got lost, so I arrived and began needing to meet the minister the next morning, not only without the dossier, but without anything to wear. <laughs> so the first mission activity was for them to get a department store open at 10 o'clock at night so that I could be dressed to go and see the minister. <laughs> so, we've got the document review, we then have the field verification. So there's two things that I'm doing in the field. One is that I'm checking, if you like, I'm doing a sort of bullshit detector test, that the, doc that the dossier is actually accurate, that they're not using photographs that are 10 years old, and that they're not taking um, perspectives that don't show unfortunate intrusive elements in their sort of key diagrams. Then the other thing that I'm doing is I'm actually interviewing the people and trying to understand issues about integrity, issues about management, uh, to, to make an evaluation of whether those other tests related to outstanding universal value are satisfied. Um, so wherever I went, I'm dealing with stakeholders. Uh, this again is Ananda, and I arrive there and I have the entire Temple Board of Management and I need to meet and greet each one of them. I need to look at the site, we need to sit down. Um, some of the meetings, there were hundreds of people. So there's poor little me sitting at the end of the table, um, surrounded by a group of people. Just to put this in context, I was in Begun for 10 days. There were 187 officers of the Department of Monuments and Archaeology assigned to look after me for 10 days. They each had a number class, and that's how I know there were 187. Um, and they are pushing information at me all the time, and I'm trying to sort wheat from chaff. Um, and then there is also the small matter of kind of managing the process. 
So this, for example, is a um, somewhat lavish and embarrassing dinner that they put on one night with entertainment, and it just so happened that the regional governor from both regions were in town, the union minister was in town, the Chinese ambassador was in town, we all got to sit together. So I need to be very careful about that and I count back literally that night, go back to my hotel room and do an email to say this was the conversation at dinner, so that there is a kind of rigorous and separate process, notwithstanding that they're doing everything they possibly can to try and convince me that it's um, all wonderful. So, um, that's a good segue to integrity. Not my integrity, but the integrity of the site. In that, um, one of the big questions was, okay, we've got a site that is significant because of the 11th to the 13th century, how is it holding up now? And there had been a major earthquake in Bagan, as many of you will know, in 2016. And so one of the questions was, well, what about the earthquake damage? And the earthquake damage was exacerbated because the military junta had done a lot of reconstruction work using modern hard masonry. And what had happened with the earthquake is that it was the modern hard masonry that had cracked. And that was terrible because it cracked, therefore it let moisture into the building and in the monsoonal rains the moisture went in and the stuff that it attacked was the older original artwork and the uh, plaster work. So the, the outer shell that had been added in the 1970s, 80s and 90s was kind of trapping the moisture in and doing the maximum amount of damage. So there were some serious integrity issues about the individual monuments and their physical state. Um, and related to that is the question of authenticity. Looking at the repairs that were being done and whether they were using traditional crafts or, and whether they were appropriate, whether there was real reconstruction happening or hypothetical reconstruction. Um, some very interesting techniques. I mean, the, the one that I loved on the left, this is scaffolding around a pagoda built of bamboo. Just imagine kind of making that and climbing all over it. And then the one on the right is they're, they're getting masonry up to the um, top of a stupa. Um, not worried too much about this sort of worker with the barrel underneath and the fact that there's loose masonry just flying up and down this flyway. So it's a very different kind of workplace um, health and safety uh, context. Uh, and some, some quite interesting stuff. So the, the image on the right, this is, this is a, a major stupa, and you can see here where a piece of masonry has fallen down as a result of the earthquake. And what they've done is they've stabilised it in situ by building a new wall to just hold it up as evidence of the earthquake damage. Um, by contrast with the middle image, which is showing a tiny remnant of original masonry surrounded by this hard, um, hard masonry, hard bricks, hard mortar, which ultimately is going to drive the salts into the original and destroy it. Um, then there were issues of um, uh, intrusion. And the big issue it began then and continuing is the impact of the hotels. Because the hotels in their scale, their location and their built form are dramatically changing the aesthetic quality of the landscape. Um, some of them, like the one on the right, um, arguably um, well designed, well site and, and fit in. But the one on the left, for example, it's fairly self-evident, this is a major um, hotel chain, that this is going to be a visually intrusive element. And the problem is these guys are just building now. So to get rid of them is going to be a really uh, problematic thing. So same hotel there on the right, you can see it's a rather unfortunate relationship with the monument behind. And I think the hotel on the left, which is in downtown Old Bagan, right on the waterfront, speaks for itself. Um, not to mention some sort of other visual intrusions that come about as a result of contemporary technology and new development. Uh, any engineers in the room? No? Okay, I suspect this was designed by an engineer. Um, highly functional, aesthetically um, somewhat problematic. <coughs> but there are also other threats, and the one that is looming is tourism if it's not managed well, obviously related to uh, the hotel issue, but also to questions of visitor experience, displacement of locals, and just basic issues such as uh, traffic management and parking and crowding. Uh, Bagan is getting, you know, of the order of 100,000 visitors a year, maybe a few more, this is a little bit hard to count. Um, Angkor, I keep mentioning Angkor because same part of the world, analogous situation, Angkor is just topping four million. So you imagine the impact of a 40-fold increase in what's happening here, it is going to have dire consequences for the place and for the people. 
And of course, the response is some new works. So, for example, everyone wants to go to sunset. The monks are not happy about having visitors climb all over the temples at sunset. So, an entrepreneur has built, with permission from government, a viewing tower. Now, I guess as these things go, given that it's 120 square kilometres of landscape and that from a distance it looks just like another pointy pagoda, it's not too bad, but it gives rise to issues about siting design, who gets to decide, who gets to use the land, the land is this appropriate? And, and these are the sort of value judgments I'm making. So this thing took me half an afternoon as I was walking around the landscape, making them drive me, trying to understand how it worked physically, visually, whether it was an appropriate intervention um, or not. Or just the, 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 the simple issue of visual planning and how, how is the urban um, part of the site actually managed in terms of the, the built forms and, and what's allowable. And, and clearly, you know, there, is, there is a lack of centralised control here. I'm not suggesting that it has to be totalitarian. I mean, and certainly that's unfortunate um, terminology given the kind of social and political change in Myanmar. But by the same token, if this is allowed to continue, it ultimately has a very um, adverse, impactful um, effect on the site and on the experience of the people who visit. Um, against which must be balanced the fact that this is a living community. So one of the days that I was there, there was this fantastic festival with a bouncy jumping castle right in front of a pagoda and a little merry-go-round. And the great irony for me is that it's sitting adjacent to the heritage zoning map that's telling them how to protect the visual quality of the landscape. Um, which brings me to the question of protection. So I've been dealing with the authenticity and integrity and some of the issues there. Um, big issue also with um, protection. And so, um, you know, one of the techniques that they've used is they've, they've zoned the land and they've specified what's allowed and not allowed. Um, they've embedded great processes for consultation with the stakeholders so that when things are going to happen that affect the temples or their surrounding landscapes, there is a process for engaging with the monks including having to give them presents before you talk to them. Um, they've got some really good interpretation happening. So if you go there as a visitor, um, particularly if you're an English speaker, really good information on site, really easy to find your, um, your way around. And, and, and dealing with the, that, that issue of um, protection management boundaries, the site is replete with these coloured boundary markers that tell you whether you're within the, um, the um, core site, which is white, or you're in the buffer zone, which is yellow, or you're outside and safe, which is brown. Um, very intuitively easy for locals to understand. And this is really important because the whole question of the agrarian landscape is fundamentally important to the, to, to, to the totality of the began. It's not the monuments, it's the monuments in their physical, visual, social, economic setting. And so these boundary markers actually tell people where they can and can't um, farm. And it seems to work really well. Nearly finished. Um, this is, and I'm not going to dwell on this slide, this is the, the management structure. Um, what I wanted to highlight <laughs> is that there are two different regions. It would be like having a, a site which crosses the state boundary in Australia. So you've got two different governors, two different sets of administration, and therefore one of the things that is, um, one would hope will make it successful is this committee here called the GANCOM, which is the Began Advisory Committee which is um, an international committee chaired by the union minister involving input from both um, regional governments but also from external advisors. I won't be long, I promise. I'm being told time's up. So look, they, they do have a really good set of policies and procedures. They are investing very heavily in capacity building and so agencies like the Getty Conservation Institute from Los Angeles are working closely with these people to build capacity in good decision making. How to assess impact, how to site new infrastructure, how to manage conservation programs. Um, there is a long way to go, but the future, I would have to say, looks very bright. Um, and it's a little bit hard to know what will happen over the next 10, 20 years. But I think, unlike Angkor, its predecessor 20 years ago, um, the Gun is well placed to manage its heritage value and to deal with its world heritage inscription in a way which cherishes those values I've outlined and passes them on intact to our future generations. And I'm very happy to do it. <laughs>
that was absolutely fascinating and such an important point in time, I think, to be reflecting on the impact of this UNESCO World Heritage inscription for Bagan. Uh, we do have some questions. So there's one up the back there and then one just here, the lady in the white shirt. So just here, yeah. Um, yeah. So if you, could, if you could just um, mention your name and keep it to a question, not a comment. Thank you. So my name's Annalise Spears Mears and um, I lived in Myanmar for many years. Um, I was just curious as to whether, in conversation, the fact that while you were in Bagan, which is, a, as you beautifully described, a hugely important cultural heritage site for Myanmar, the Myanmar army was occupying Mwau, which is an equivalently important cultural heritage site for the Rakhine people. Um, was that something that in any way came up or that you think should be considered in these sorts of processes? That, that's a, 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 it's a really good question, and I, I can answer it best by saying before I agreed to the assignment, I, I, I grappled with the ethics, particularly in view of what was kind of happening with Rohingya and other minorities. And it's, it's an absolute um, balancing act and values-based judgment, a moral, a moral compass issue. Um, where I ultimately landed, and it's not just an argument of convenience, is saying that in fact what is important is getting Myanmar engaged with the rest of the global community. And so, you know, hooking it into something like the UNESCO framework and having people from the Getty Foundation or from AusAid involved is probably the best way to support. Now, you can absolutely read that as well as implicit acceptance of inappropriate practices. But I guess my view is that um, if UNESCO, Australia, ICOMOS back off, um, it's very likely to get worse. But you know, I don't, I don't put that forward as empirical wisdom. It's just, it's just how I resolve it. And is there nothing in the process that... No, no. And, and, and to be clear, um, UNESCO deals with this site on merits in accordance with the World Heritage Convention. ICOMOS did exactly the same. Okay, we had another question here, the lady in white. So uh, if I understand it correctly, so it, this is a world heritage site, is it? World heritage, yes. So like cultural heritage site? Yes, it's inscribed, the um, world heritage can be inscribed as natural, cultural or mixed. Yeah. And that depends on the criteria. The criteria that this property satisfies are all cultural criteria. Okay. Um, so is it possible to argue that this is actually a cultural landscape? Sorry, is it possible that to argue that this is actually a cultural landscape? That, that's that's what Criterion Six is all about. This is this is a cultural landscape. Okay. And it's a it's it's a sacred lived in associated cultural landscape where it's not just the physical presence; it's also okay. the belief. Okay. So I want to know: um, Are the residents there? Are they being restricted restricted from agricultural activities or like other kinds of activities during the nomination and or after the nomination? Um, uh, yes and no is the answer to that. Um, in fact, overall, agriculture is being facilitated. And I showed a slide which had um, a boundary marker and furrows and had a, a cow with a plough or a cart. Um, the agricultural um, landscape of production is actually a really important part of the visual setting for the monuments. And so the land is actually managed to facilitate agriculture but those boundary markers are actually regulatory. So yes, there is some regulation. And I think I bet my house on the fact that there was some tidying up and some restriction uh, organised well before I got there. And I'm mindful of that in forming the judgments I form, but I can't be hypothetical about what it might have been. I mean, I'm, I'm not completely stupid. I can see when a new path has been laid or you know, when turf has been rolled out and you can still see that it hasn't grown together and think, well, maybe it wasn't grass two weeks ago. <laughs> okay, we have a question down the front here from this lady. There's a microphone coming, thank you. That's fascinating, but I'm, well, I'm curious, to what extent is the ability to put a site on a heritage listing and to continue to protect it in all the cultural aspects, um, subject to the level of education, um, the level of commitment of the government and also the economic resources of the country that they can come into doing this because there's obviously a 
huge job to continue, continue to maintain all of that. And so obviously we need the Google, um, but to what, uh, to what extent do economic, education and other social factors come into it? Thank you, that's a fabulous question. They, 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 are, they are all huge, and for a large, complex site like this with a, uh, a living community, they, they are, they are <coughs> all, all the bigger. And it, you, you can't protect it through regulation. You can do as many coloured maps as you like. Ultimately, it's a question of capacity building, which means that local people have livelihoods. It might mean, because of the World Heritage Inscription, that those livelihoods change and more people actually get involved in service industry related to tourism. Um, but people need to have livelihoods, or they, or they do stuff that creates livelihoods for them, like cutting down forests um, or changing the use of the land in a way that cuts across the values of the sites. But it is incredibly challenging, particularly in developing economies, especially low OECD economies because you can't just flip the switch. There has to be a gradual process, which is why you need external institutional support like the Getty Conservation Institute. But it is a far from imperfect model. Um, there are approximately 1,120 properties inscribed on the World Heritage List. There are more than 50 on the list of World Heritage in Danger. Um, now, a bunch of them are because they're in conflict zones. But a bunch of them are because the management needs and the conservation needs that will allow their values to be transmitted are beyond the capacity of the state party. And the obligation under the World Heritage Convention vests in the national government who nominated the site. And so it requires quite a lot of real commitment. Absolutely, absolutely. And it, it, and it, it, it requires a nuanced understanding of what the values are. So the danger. The danger here is to rush in and, and do this stuff and conserve the masonry and to ignore um, perhaps you know, the, the Buddhist worship, to put all the really great statues in the museum where people can't go and make offerings, which cuts across the merit-making aspect of the value. Um, the worst example of that in the world is uh, a city called Shah Prasabs in Uzbekistan, um, which was a, um, a medieval um, a city with stone monumental buildings and a lot of wooden infrastructure alleyways, it would be hutongs and things like that in Asia. And the national government has come in and got rid of all the wooden stuff to make views of the monuments and destroy the integrity of the, the city because they didn't understand what the values were. Um, there is a danger of that here in focusing on the monuments at the expense of the activities that take place within the landscape. Great questions. Um, we have time for one more. I might ask it. Um, I do have a question. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> you can ask I'll ask you later. Much more of a, a combined observation and question. Sydney University has had a very long involvement in the Bagan area and elsewhere through the works of people like Bob Hudson and so on and the ceramics. Now, has the work of Sydney University over these several decades fed into this process? That's the question. Yes. Short answer: that They need to do work to get their records more accessible. They have heaps, but they're all sitting in folders, and that's you know in this day and age, I, I put up a, a, a slide there that had some folders on the right and some guys at the computer on the left. The guys at the computer on the left are busy digitising and linking for all their work because there is a vast amount of data, and Hudson's work is a prime amongst that. Um, that's a nice segue to mention CX contribution to Bob Hudson's activities and also Professor Mark Allen who works in um, Buddhist studies and he's uh, had a project in Myanmar recently, um, something about the book with a thousand pages or something, but we, we will need to uh, change the title of this event to Land of 3,595 Pagodas and thank you Richard for bringing that to our attention and for your time tonight, it was absolutely fascinating, thank you. Thank you.